We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Well, greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Burn Power, the anadromist. You may notice my hair blowing up behind me here. I'm sitting on the heater, so if I suddenly uh, explode into flames, you'll know why. Actually, it's not that hot, but obviously I can sit on it. But it was I figured this would be a nice artistic uh, image for you, um, which fits the subject of today's Labrie lecture, which I gave back in 2018. And it was on the subject of beauty, the need for beauty. And uh, one thing I want to say is that uh, uh, Sir Roger Scruton just passed away on the 12th of January, 2020, this year. And he was 75 years old. And I would say that uh, a, a chunk of my uh, What is Beauty or the Need for Beauty lecture came uh, not so much from him, although certain elements were certainly inspired by him, but uh, was inspired, I was inspired to do it because I read his short book on beauty and felt like, I really need to talk about this. And uh, so in a way, this lecture is, we'll say, a posthumous tribute to Sir Roger Scruton. And the other thing I want to say is that it was fascinating to me, and you can hear the questions and answers at the end of the lecture, that this lecture caused almost as much, uh, what, what should I say, um, question and, and comment and, and pushback as my lecture on conceptual humanity. And in a way they are connected. Um, because if one doesn't see the true beauty of the world, if everything is just what we say it is, and not what it is, then why not create any image of humanity you wish? So you might want to go back and listen to that. But the point of this is this. I think that beauty is a problem for us because one of the things that's happened in the last hundred years or so is we've moved to a state of further and further and further uh, egalitarianism. And what that means is that everything is equal. Therefore, no one is seen as, as being beautiful. No one is seen as being, uh, no, no image is more beautiful than another. No uh, building is more beautiful than another. A natural landscape is just as good as a, a, a dance club. Uh, you know, in other words, everything becomes equalized. Now, we don't really believe that. We really know that, oh my goodness, that's a very beautiful human being. That's a very beautiful land. That's a very beautiful uh, uh, building. But the truth is, there's also something in us that wants to kill beauty. And I didn't really go into that in this lecture, but I think at some point I might. So, anyway, uh, this was just a short introduction. And if you get those slight little feelings inside of you about like, ooh, I don't like the way he's talking about beauty, welcome to the club. Uh, you aren't alone. Without any further ado, the lecture. Okay. All right, so I am going to begin, and we'll call this the need for beauty. And the topic is going to be beauty, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm doing this right now, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing. Last year, uh, I also traveled around Europe. I spent about six months going from place to place. I dropped in at Labrie at that time. And one of the things I've been thinking, I, I've been working on several projects uh, which I really haven't shown anyone. Um, one, a film, and uh, others, some photographs uh, that relate very directly to the subject of beauty. And it's something I've been thinking about for a while. But as I was traveling, I was noticing, for instance, 
uh, Bernini statues in Rome. It was my first time in Rome, or or um, or even this time I was in uh, uh, Paris and they were having a show of Alphonse Mucha, and he did all these uh, posters and poster art where there was often a, a a woman as a central feature. When I was in the Vatican uh, and I was in Saint Paul's uh, Cathedral uh, or Basilica, what, what is it? Basilica. Basilica, yeah. Anyway, you know, it's huge. But I remembered um, Michelangelo's uh, Pietà was there somewhere, but I didn't see it right away. So I'd kind of done a circuit inside, and all of a sudden I came up to it, and it just struck me like a load of bricks. I mean, just the intensity of it. Um, and, I, and, and I was also thinking a lot about how often... Uh, people today have kind of disappeared into uh, what we might call geekdom, uh, nerd culture, uh, where we have these things where people are making these little fan art and and they're they're constantly going over their Star Wars characters or video game characters or something. And I've been thinking about that as an art form and what that meant for a while. And there I was confronted with something which is just like absolutely, certainly beyond my comprehension of how you could even make such a thing. Uh, and I thought that that beauty, this you know, at this point um, in the past, people really strove to find what was beautiful. And I was also just as convinced that people today don't care as much. And you can see it in in the world around us. And I'd also been reading. Uh, oh well, I think I mentioned this to you as well that I was recently in the Louvre, and everyone was walking up to the Mona Lisa. You know, just walking up getting their camera out, going click, and leaving. And that was it. That was the experience of the Mona Lisa, which I'm sure they would then put on their social media, get a few likes and hearts, get a little dopamine rush, and then say they had seen it. Now, I was sitting there. I didn't. I, I took a film of it, because I wasn't taking a film of it. I was taking a film of them, how we now consume art, which is to say we don't. Um, it's gone beyond being a, a, something you consume and just simply being something that it's like you don't even know if you've actually been there or not. So I uh, also in the last year have come across different people discussing things. There's a, an English philosopher, Roger Scruton, who wrote a book which I'm drawing some of this from, although I've been thinking about this for a lot longer. And his book is called Beauty, A Very Short Introduction. I would highly recommend that if this subject interests you at all. Uh, it's not very big and it's, you know, it's probably about 100 pages tops, pretty small. Also, uh, there's a psychiatrist, a clinical psychiatrist and university professor, Jordan Peterson, who's been getting some traction. And he talks about beauty on occasion. I've got a little clip of him discussing it that we'll get to. Also, last year when I was here, Ellis Potter, a former Labrie worker, now living in Basel, came by and did a discussion on beauty and music. And that also made me think quite a bit about the need for beauty. Now, what I've been doing is, like I said, I've been working on my own projects, really thinking consciously about the about beauty and what it is. Uh, also, when I was in Georgia, the country, not the state, I always have to say that because everyone's like, yeah, you were in Savannah, it's a nice town. Well, I spent quite a bit of time with a group of musicians and dancers, singers and dancers, and what they were doing, both singing and dancing, was truly beautiful. And I think that's one of the reasons that attracts me to Georgian culture is they still have things like that. They're not all ironic, cynical, uh, snarky. You know, they haven't got to that stage in culture. I hope they never do, because it's not a good stage in culture, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, let me tell you about a little bit of my own relationship to beauty and why this has mattered to me. I grew up predominantly in suburban California, but it was the suburbs which were still close to the hills and, and uh, trees and things. So I used to escape the suburbs by going into the backyard, literally, and just going up into the hills. I, I remember finding a, a rock quarry. I mean, finding the Grand Canyon couldn't have been like a more impressive thing to me because it was just like, wow, all these rocks and such. I had no idea how dangerous it was. We were, you know, like you'd climb up around it and the rocks would fall down under you. And, you know, I was like... 10, 11 years old. I'm sure my mother wouldn't have been happy to have seen me doing that, but what an experience. Um, music became very important to me. I started off with, in uh, you know, I'm old enough to have started off in the late 60s listening to rock music and stuff, but for some reason, 
my musical tastes, while I certainly still appreciate that music, kept mutating into eventually I was able to appreciate. I remember discovering, uh, I remember, I have the actual recording still. I, I went back and bought it one day of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony conducted by Leopold Stokowski on London Records Phase 4, for those of you who are vinyl geeks, which I'm sure there's no one here. So, um, but no, it's like I remember that experience. Later, I remember coming across a recording of Ralph Vaughan Williams' Symphonia Antarctica, which was just like left me devastated. But I also remember the stuff just the way music felt. And eventually I would have many more musical experiences. My first experience with art and aesthetics, I realized, came because I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And because I started hitting puberty around the same time that uh, the San Francisco kind of hippie world was producing these posters for the Fillmore and the Avalon ballrooms and all these kind of hippie venues, what they drew on was just absolutely incredible. And I remember these like psychedelic colors. Later I would discover they were all, uh, so many of them were based on Mucha's Art Nouveau style but really just like pumped up with photographic images, you know, uh, things we now do like really simply with some sort of online app or something, you sort of blam, and you, you've got your strange looking thing. But I was really impressed with that. In relationship to human beauty, I kind of saw myself, well, what happened was when I was around seven years old, uh, there's actually a photo of me around six and a half years old. In Hawaii, uh, I actually spent four years of my life in Hawaii. And me standing next to a young, blonde-haired girl. And I was holding a cat, and it was just like... And I looked at that person, I said, where in the world did he go? What would have happened if you'd stayed in Hawaii instead of moving to California? And because what happened was, when I moved to California, mid-school uh, year, which I really don't recommend anyone do to their children ever, uh, I kind of crash-landed and uh, never really fit in with uh, suburban California society after that. So I spent the next seven years, I had a couple of, you know, young boys I would play with who were kind of friends, you know, um, no contact with girls whatsoever, except in school where I was just like absolutely afraid of them. However, that didn't mean I didn't see them. It just meant that I didn't have any way of communicating with them. And I was so almost comically uh, self-loathing that, like, when some girl in, in junior high school, what I believe they now call middle school, I don't know, why did they change the name? Anyway, uh, when, when some girl sent someone up to me to tell me that she liked me, rather than getting the clue that maybe there was something there as a little, you know, oh, someone likes me, I took it as that they were actually mocking me. So that was how I looked at myself, as being kind of a freak. I was also getting pimples around that time. That doesn't do much for your self-image and such like that. I think as a result of this kind of deprivation, it made me see women in a different sort of way. And I'm not saying that's always healthy, because it, it put too much distance. And I had to learn years and years of how to actually talk to women and approach them. There was a one event in my life which was like someone just put an electrical charge in me. And I'm going to describe it a little later, but it was a man who picked me up with a severe skin disease. Um, no one up until this point, I was around 21 years old, no one up until this point had even discussed deformity. I mean, it was just like something you didn't mention. If we saw someone who's now quite common in America, these extraordinarily people who are like twice my size, and as you can see, I'm not a small individual, these massive people. Well, every now and then you would see one of those people when I was younger. And my mom would always say, you know, don't look. Don't stare at them. But that was about it. That was the extent of the freaky sort of people I would run into. So no one had mentioned at all how, how deformed people could be. It was like, you don't discuss it. Well, once I, I, I was actually thinking about it right before I met this guy. I started thinking about, I believe it was the elephant man, which became a very important thing in my life. And after meeting this guy, that would realize, oh, well, first of all, I don't look like him, <laughs> you know? So I'm not, on, on this scale, I am way up the line here, you know? But then I started thinking about the whole spectrum, from the most beautiful to the most hideous person. Trust me, the word hideous applies here, because I'm going to show you what a person like this looks like in a bit. 
Um, and that will probably be the only thing I show you, and, which is odd in a, in a lecture about beauty. But I want you to understand something about the human appearance. So, and then I think the final thing that really helped me was when I first came to Labrie. Now, I had, had uh, I'd become a Christian at the age of 15, which, thank God, because that would have been, I can't imagine what would have happened at that point if I had just gone on with uh, the guy who thought he was nothing. You know, fortunately at that point I started saying, oh, there is meaning, I have meaning, wonderful. You know, and, and I started being able to talk to uh, girls at that point. Uh, I started to socialize, it was a long story there. But um, when I got to Labrie, there was something about the environment here that really started to open up the notion of the beauty of human relationships, uh, conversations, uh, time spent with people. Of course I'd had good conversations prior to this, and of course I've had it since then. But I started to think of it as something to aspire towards. That it wasn't just simply utilitarian conversations to get something, nor was it biblical ideology or any other ideology. I just started thinking like, wow, we can actually talk to each other and get to know each other. And that's real. And it's not like an illusion, a sociological, biological illusion based upon you know, reductionist facts about what it means to be human. So... What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to really define beauty here because it's so hard and I've got far more to say than I'm going to get to. I'm probably going to miss some things that I mean to say. So certainly ask questions at the end because um, I'm sure I'll say something that, well, what, what did you mean by that or uh, whatever. But what I am going to do is maybe show you some of the addresses where beauty lives and allow you to decide for yourself if you want to go visiting there. One of the ways I could have done this is to discuss uh, the, you know, the beauty in nature, uh, beauty in art, beauty in animals, beauty in landscapes, beauty in the human body, beauty in language, beauty in music, beauty in a well-cooked meal, beauty in conversation, or, or what is the beauty of holiness? And all, you know, kind of gone by categories like that. But I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, like, eh, there's something else I'm trying to get to. So this is going to be just a series of statements. It says beauty is, but you could almost say it beauty does. That these are things that beauty seems to produce. So the first one is beauty is meaningful. Now this should go without saying. However, given the times we live in, for instance, if a person spends a certain amount of their time looking at screens, how much beauty is on those screens? Real beauty, in them, not just clever, slick, uh, imagery or beautiful things in people, landscapes uh, used to suggest beauty. How much beauty is actually there? And that's a good question. Now, I don't have a good answer. I do know you could probably extract an image or extract, say, some lecture or extract uh, a film and by spending time with it, find beauty within it. But I think just the mosaic of day-to-day, -day, like snooping around, looking at things, I don't know if there's any beauty there at all, because of just the nature of the experience. I'm going to play you right now a short couple of minute clip by Roger Scruton, English uh, philosopher, uh, social critic. He spends a lot of time thinking about art, but another person that I've gotten a lot of good insight on beauty, I think the person who really started getting me to think about it was Hans Ruckmacher. And there are some lectures downstairs on art where he really starts opening certain questions up. And so there are certainly questions that uh, inspired me. So I'm going to play this for you. It's, uh, I've made it as loud as possible. It should be audible, but give it a, a listen. What is beauty? I would say I, I can't tell you what beauty is. I can show you beauty if the moral thing of this aesthetic uh, a modality in the Dory Vedan system is beauty. I can tell you exactly what beauty is in pointing it, but I can't define it anymore just because it is prior to any knowledge or any uh, thing that I can say. It's not by definition for me, it's not because I assert it, it's not a model that I put on reality, it's not my way of asserting reality, it's my acceptance of reality. It's there before I come. Beauty has fallen into disrepute. For some reason, uh, people have uh, marginalized the pursuit of beauty, both from the arts and from everyday life. Why it's missing is an interesting question. I think there's been a huge cultural shift 
uh, uh, an almost deliberate attempt to expel beauty from the place in human life that it naturally occupies, which is the center. Although, of course, everybody um, is aware of the value of beauty when they see it, they don't recognize the need also to create it around themselves. The, the message that art has been perpetrating for the last 50 or even 100 years, that in the end, that our aspirations to be something better are all uh, self-deception and delusion. Of course there is natural beauty, and there's the beauty of the human face and the human form, there's the beauty of animals uh, and the beauty of landscape. Everybody is aware of that. It stands there as an independent witness to the meaning of the universe. When we went to the seaside when we were children, I had a sense of awe when the sea was first viewed. Then, living on the edge of the countryside, I got to, used to walking around the countryside and, and again having this sense that, that, that this was something vaster than myself. Uh, but that I was at home in it uh, and at peace with it. And that, that was something which I had very much when I was a child. Someone like C.S. Lewis would say, of course, uh, this is implanted in you. So this is what the everlasting man uh, embraces, you know, this, this sense of wonder. It's what it, it, he is simply waking up to the fact that he's a created being and not a creator. And uh, well, once you point out that there is a difference between life that's lived with the idea of beauty in focus and life that is not so lived, then people immediately understand it and recognize that there is something missing. Interestingly enough, the music they play, I am pretty sure he would have said, <laughs> because it's something just functional to like hold this place. It's not particularly beautiful at all. It should go without saying that beauty is meaningful, but as he points out, we seem to be living in a world with almost positively opposed to notions of beauty. For instance, in art, we've, we seem to have gone from this, maybe it was an overemphasis on, on the beautiful, so it finally by the end of the 19th century became just the appearance of beauty, to suddenly people saying like, well, that's not real life. You know, so we want something that's more real, but not necessarily beautiful. More self-expression, but not beautiful. So, for instance, Marcel Duchamp kind of kicks off this anti-art, anti-beauty thing with, in serious form when he takes a urinal, signs it with the name R. Mutt, and puts it in a gallery show. And this urinal has showed up in probably every art history book since. Because this was now what he was doing was saying, you're making too big a deal out of this capital A art stuff. Eh? And maybe people were making too big a deal out of it. But the ultimate message that seems to have been developed is well, anything can be art. So, you know. Uh, and I've been, I, I worked in the art world in New York for several years, uh, delivering art, uh, working with artists, going to almost every gallery and museum in New York. I mean, I saw things that it was like, what happened was it became like anti-art art, which became like just more just philosophical message. Or even uh, when we talk about self-expression, you'd see, like I, I would go pick up something. I remember going to this one guy to pick up. He had an old Formica tabletop, one of these kind of plastic things. It was, it was rough and bent, had this uh, kind of aluminum going around the outside of it. It was probably made in the 1950s or something. He wanted me to pick it up. So I picked it up to take it out and goes, no, no, no. He says, you have to wrap it in bubble wrap and protect it. And I said, I got it. It's art. <laughs> just because you just called it art. Whereas, in fact, my own opinion is, well, if you really want to make this artistic, what I should do is put it on a chain and drag it. And at least give it a little more history. You know, uh, I, with, I think it was the same week. I went to pick up, uh, me and a friend, we were both doing art, um, uh, Went to pick up uh, something for a small uh, group show. We went and it was six brand new, uh, you know, shiny garbage cans, metal garbage cans. With they still have the uh, the label of the company on the side. And we took them, we put them in the truck, and we also had some Christmas tree lights. Ultimately, what happened was he flipped it over, he strung the Christmas lights off the on top of it. That was it. And um, I said to my friend, I said, you know, 
you move too many garbage cans, you're not an art mover anymore. You become a garbage collector. And there was something, I actually got in trouble once. I was at a, a museum show, and it was like Yoko Ono was there, and she was had Sean uh, Lennon there, and they, she had this, had, she did not make this, she had someone construct a very long set of white tables with all white chess pieces on them. And she had herself photographed at the end with Sean, almost incestuously in a sense. But then there was another guy who had marbles on the floor and then someone else. And this one woman I knew said, well, so what do you think of this show? And uh, I said, it's kind of the emperor's new clothes. I was just over at the uh, thrift store art show where nothing had cost the collector more than $25. And it was funky, but there was nothing... Uh, Everything there seemed to be some sort of genuine emotion. Someone's trying to get ours. This just seems empty to me. And she goes, well, well, you know I'm an art gallery owner, right? I said, yeah. So? <laughs> you know, but it, it would just, I mean, at that point in the art world, this was the early 90s, it just struck me as so empty. I mean, one time I walked in, and this is art suddenly started to become political tract. And I walked in to a show, and I was, and at first I was like really struck because there was like a, a completely stuffed, full-feathered turkey hanging from the wall. And I was like, oh, that gets my attention. Then I looked around and go, oh, it's an anti-meat show. It's like, that's, you know. So, so rather than allowing me to appreciate the texture of the turkey, it was basically telling me, don't eat this thing. You know, and it's just like, okay, if you want to have that discussion, that's a discussion for another day. But if you want to call this art, I'm sorry, <clears throat> You know, you just made propaganda. Tarkovsky, Andrei Tarkovsky, who uh, made um, some amazing films. If you've never seen them, you really should. Uh, Andrei Rublev's story about a Russian icon painter, uh, Solaris and uh, Nostalgia, uh, Mirror, uh, uh, and my favorite, Stalker. All of these are absolutely amazing works of art. And he wrote a book in the late 80s that came out right around the same time he died, around 87 or so where he said, uh, he, I, this is my favorite book on art in the 20th century. Tarkovsky was definitely a Christian. And, but also, definitely, he wasn't your, like, quote-unquote, Christian artist. You know, he wasn't making Jesus propaganda. And he said this, art is born, this is from his book Sculpting in Time, art is born and takes hold wherever there is a timeless and insatiable longing for the spiritual, for the ideal. That longing which draws people to art. Modern art has taken a wrong turn in abandoning the search for the meaning of existence in order to affirm the value of the individual for his own sake. What purports to be art begins to look like the eccentric occupation of suspect characters who maintain that any personalized action is of intrinsic value simply as a display of self-will. But in an artistic creation, the personality does not assert itself. It serves another higher communal ideal. The artist is always the servant. This is like in direct contrast to the way people look at most forms of art today. The artist is always the servant and is perpetually trying to pay for the gift that has been given to him as if by a miracle. Modern man, however, does not want to make any sacrifice, even though true affirmation of the self can only be expressed in sacrifice. We are gradually forgetting about this, and at the same time inevitably losing all sense of human calling. So what he says is the more we have self-expression, the more we lose even the ability to understand beauty in a sense. And I, and I think about this when I think about how many selfies people take as their little mini act of self-expression, you know. Uh, does that help you understand yourself? I, I would think usually not. I mean, occasionally there may be something very artistic about it, but I would say the vast amount of selfies I've seen people taking are just to document the fact they were standing somewhere. Like, I'm standing in front of an Alaskan mountain. Okay, click, I'm here. You know, now I'm going to put that online, get likes and hearts. So we look at our world today. There is an uglification of culture in the name of things like comfort and convenience. Think of any parking lot in America, any big parking lot at a mall. Think of the mall. Think of what's going on in there. Is there anything that you can call beauty in there? There's style, whatever that means. There's clever stuff. But is there anything of beauty there? 
There's also, as uh, Roger Scruton says, the cult of ugliness in art through self-expression, which can re be revealed in things like cans of an artist's own excrement. Yes, that's been done. Films of an artist vomiting. That's been done. Uh, just a simple disheveled bed with like all the paraphernalia, used condoms, cigarettes and stuff. That's been done. Pile of bricks. That's been done. So art... Uh, and I think uh, what if what Tarkovsky says is true, the ar artists have to get back to being the servant and exploring beauty. Um, but then there's the, just the utilitarian nature of so much commerce and civic planning and, like, so much of what's on the Internet. It's just, uh, so much of it is just utilitarian. And it creates a strangeness. Dostoevsky once said, beauty will save the world. And... People pondered that for a while. But just think of this, for instance, and I think Dostoevsky would have thought of this. Think of Christ's death on the cross. Now, the image itself is not what we call pretty. It is, in fact, horrifying. But the meaning is the ultimate act of beauty. And it is, like uh, Tarkovsky says, an act of sacrifice. The real question is that, without beauty, is anything in life meaningful? If we live a life where everything is either utilitarian or just commercial or prosaic, what is the meaning of living this life? So, the next thing. Beauty is a necessity. This might be a strange thing to say in our times because you look around and everything from architecture to art to home design to traffic patterns to the commodities we shop for every day, the world has become increasingly like just chaotic, hectic, frantic, ugly, and yet it just goes on doesn't seem to need beauty to function. Um, who needs beauty when you can just plug in your favorite media and be diverted and entertained and disappear completely, or so it would seem, from the realities of the world? And yet that's just the point. Uh, the more of the illusory world we create, the more we can ignore the real one and how we live in it. Uh, one thing I'm really impressed with, uh, having spent the last 22 years in Alaska, and, you know, being up there, I've spent a certain amount of time involved with, say, ecological discussions. And it's amazing how, like, especially a lot of summer workers will come, they'll work for the summer, and then maybe they'll go work in a ski resort, or they'll take a trip to Thailand for the winter, or something like that, go to Costa Rica for the winter, then come back, like, next season, and then in maybe two, three seasons, they're not there anymore. A semi-nomadic existence. A lot of... Uh, People under a certain age kind of live a semi-nomadic existence these days. Or as Paul Virilio says, the, the world is now divided into the refugees and the residents. And the refugees are the people trying to get into whatever they think this is. And the residents are the people who can live anywhere in the world because they have all the gear and the tech for it, which is us. So it's evidently we're living here and most of us are not from here. What's interesting is that in Alaska, people talk about ecology and stuff all the time. And yet, they are not connected to a piece of ground. They don't have to care about the actual ground they're walking on because they're going to be leaving it soon. And I think to myself, that's exactly this illusory world. How can you say how much you care about the environment and just be moving from place to place to place and not actually care for a specific environment? You know, and the beauty of that. Also, uh, you see, uh, in modern architecture, one of the hallmarks is just pure utility. Also, cost-saving measures. So, you know, com or, you know, money and utility. So people build these buildings that are just, like, big and straight, and, you know, it's almost like a disease, whether it's Shanghai or Miami. There's just, like, <clears throat> massive buildings just going up. People don't really think about what they mean, but here's the interesting thing, is when these buildings get old, even though they were built for utility, they become useless because nobody wants to move into them. However, when you build a building that's beautiful, over time, no one wants to rip that down. They want to keep it. Even though at the time, what was the point, you know, what was the, uh, the point of beauty? I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, uh, you know, all art is essentially useless. And he meant that as high praise. Because we don't need it like we need food and shelter. It is useless from that point of view. However, without art, everything else becomes useless. Without beauty, everything becomes useless.
People will travel to Europe and look at these old buildings. But no one goes to, say, Provo, Utah to look at the buildings. Or, you know, who even goes to Dallas to look at the buildings? Dallas, Texas, or White Plains, New York. These places have modern architecture. No one cares. No one's going there to see the beauty of the buildings. You know, if they're there, they'll say, oh, that's really a tall one. Oh, yeah, look at that one. It's got a funny shape. But no one actually cares the way they care about, you know, lining up to get into Notre Dame in Paris or something, which then, then there's the question of do they see what they're seeing, <laughs> you know. Um, next, beauty is sad. There's always an aspect of sorrow to be beauty. Beauty speaks of something missing. Haven't you ever had this experience where you're just like, even, even here, like yesterday, I just got stopped at this one point where I was just walking along the trail here on the road, and I just stopped for a second. It was just like, just a momentary configuration of the clouds and the mountains and everything. It's just, and it was going to disappear really soon, just the way it felt. But there's something inside that's just like, oh, I wish I could give this to someone. I wish I, I could share this. But even still, it's, it's tough to share beautiful experiences. There's a sense in which it provokes a sense of the great rightness in the world and the wrongness. That is to say, because it highlights that which is imperfect. So, you know, you come, you see this amazing spectacle of these mountains here. And then you go back to wherever you're from, live in a suburban house. And, you know, it's the same with what I was saying about the beauty of conversation. You have some really great conversations here. You, you hope everyone will want to have these kind of conversations. Then you go back home and, you know what? They're not so interested in those conversations. It's that deflation, that sense of like... Why can't it be this good all the time? And beauty does that. Beauty speaks of the possible perfection of life by showing us in those few moments when life does seem perfect. And yet, whether it's the daily grind or the utter pain that sometimes accompanies life, the beautiful sometimes just doesn't seem to fit in. Maybe we just don't have time for it. Again, Tarkovsky says, when I speak of the aspiration of the beautiful, of the ideal as the ultimate aim of art, which grows from a yearning for that ideal, I am not for a moment suggesting that art should shun the dirt of the world. So he's not suggesting that beauty, uh, and, and he's talking about it specifically in relationship to art, should somehow be um, this overly romantic, overly pretty world, where nothing wrong goes wrong. Uh, he says, on the contrary, the artistic image is always a metonym, where one thing is substituted for another, the smaller for the greater. To tell of what is living, the artist uses something dead. To speak of the infinite, he shows the finite. Substitution. The infinite cannot be made into matter, but it is possible to create an illusion of the infinite, the image. He also says, the allotted function of art is not, as is often assumed, to put, a, to put across ideas, to propagate thoughts, to serve an ex example, and I would add, or to make propaganda. The aim of art is to prepare a person for death, to plow and harrow his soul, rendering it capable of turning to the good. And I would say that he understands that beauty is right in there. Exactly. <coughs> that, that it isn't about living in a world where everything... Uh, sometimes you go to... There are certain places where you go, uh, certain homes, certain places where everything is too nice, too classy, too much quality stuff going on. Not enough of the meaning uh, beyond the image of having the perfect silverware or the perfect uh, you know, living room or the perfect exterior to your house or living in the really the nicest little town. You know, There's something beyond that. Uh, art is also called on to redeem pain with beauty. And I think that's one of its functions. And that's why Christ on the cross is the ultimate symbol of both beauty and pain and redemption. Well, here's a nice one. Beauty is frightening. And I mean that. For instance, interestingly enough, when the first uh, people of the Romantic movement began, began to come to Switzerland, they said, those mountains are not beautiful. They are sublime. They came up with this word sublime. Sublime does not mean, oh, I think that's a beautiful mountain. What a lovely view. I should get a photograph. Sublime means I am humbled by the, just awed by this thing. This thing itself 
has something. And it makes me feel much humbler in front of it. That's the sublime. We use different words to describe beauty. Sublime is a good word to keep in your vocabulary, rather than just go, oh, pretty mountains. Pretty, pretty is almost like the little weak sister to beauty. You know, pretty is like cute. Cute is the really teeny baby, which I don't know if should be used at all to describe something beautiful. But beauty, among other things, beauty is frightening. I'm going to play another clip here by this guy, Jordan Peterson. And um, he talks about, he's talking with this guy, he, had, he became kind of famous for, among other things, saying to people, you know, you want to change the whole world. And yet, what you really should do is rather than go out into the world, it's the same as like the, uh, the ecology and people traveling around all the time. Rather than saying, oh, I want a perfect world, he says, like, you really should start with your own life. You should start cleaning up your room. And so he became famous for saying, among other things, clean up your room. But he didn't mean just make it a nice room. He meant as a way to start essentially tackling the problems of the world, to clean up your own environment and to do something. And one of the things he says is to make them beautiful. Now, he's talking in this, this clip, uh, with, it lasts for about five minutes, with this guy who's kind of a comedian of sorts, uh, on, has a YouTube channel, but he's interviewing him. Uh, and Peterson is essentially, he starts talking about having plants where we, where we are in this conversation. He starts about, well, why don't you get a plant in your room? You know, get some vegetation and take care of that and make it a, a place where maybe something could live. So we'll start there. And then he talks about beauty. And then you have to water the damn thing. But then there's something living in your room. You might hope my room is the sort of place where something could hypothetically live. live like yeah, me. Yeah, like you. Yeah, exactly. And, and then, then you, you might, might actually start to live. Well, you might. You might. If you set the stage for it, you right. might start to play the part. And then you think, wow, well, that's may it. Maybe I could make it beautiful. It's like then not mm. only would you have a room, if you want to get opposition from people around you who aren't happy about you trying to improve things. Cleaning might not do it, although it might, because people think, well, who the hell do you think you are cleaning up your room? It's like, you know, yeah. because are you better than me? It's like, well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe for you, a second. Maybe you maybe, think you can think you are. Maybe. Man, maybe, you know, if you're, if you're, maybe that's your brother, your older brother or your father. He's all covered with Cheetos dust and his guts hanging out and he's watching TV, smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. and thinking, oh, you think you're better than me, eh? It's like, oh, well, yeah. you know, it's not actually Maybe that not hard. today. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not today, so, but so maybe So there's going to be, there's going to be resistance. But you, that'll be nothing like the resistance you'll get when you, if you try to start making your room beautiful. Man, mm. that'll produce resistance because beauty is absolutely terrifying to people because beauty, beauty highlights what's ugly. And so if you start to make your room beautiful, then everything around that isn't like that just starts to to glow, mm. in, in, like in, in, the, in, the, in the worst sense. So is that dangerous then, oh, to yes. beautify things? It's terribly dangerous. That's why people are afraid of beauty, but it's the greatest thing you can do. Because it puts you in alignment with, like, beautiful things are beautiful for a reason. Right. The, the, that beauty has depth, like it's real depth, man. That, 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 that's what gets you in touch with the transcendent and the divine, is mm. beauty. You introduce that into your room, you're playing with fire, and people will resist it. And so you can think, well, first of all, I'll make my room spartan and clean and neat, sort of like military level discipline, like clean. It's like, okay, now you got it cleaned up. And then you think, my clothes are in order, I got it cleaned up. Well, now, now maybe I'll try to, I'll do something that'll make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have to learn what beauty is too. And that's really hard. Mm. Like that's, and that'll be scary. And that's going to be scary because oh, if yeah. you're, especially if you're a dude, you can't, you yeah. know. Well, you're also going to think, well, what the hell do I know? I have terrible taste, which right. is undoubtedly true. Yeah. So do your best, you know, get a print of something, get a print of a great painting, put it on your room. It's like, you think, oh, I don't know what the hell that thing's doing there. It's like, look out, man, that thing's got power. <laughs> yeah. So look, think about it. This is, I was in this museum a while back in, in New York and it was, I don't remember which museum it was in, but it was full of these paintings from the late Renaissance. And so they were, there was like a dozen of them in this one room mm -hmm. and, and like by people like M Michelangelo and Da Vinci. Rodin, and, stuff like yeah, that? Well, or no? Rodin would be later, but the same caliber, caliber of, of artists, mm -hmm. same caliber. And so I was in that room and it's like, every painting on that wall was worth $300 million, like minimum. You couldn't buy those paintings, like they're yeah. priceless. But if they ever went for market, it'd be, that's about what they'd be worth. And it was like a dozen of them in there. I thought, wow, there's like $3.6 billion worth of paintings in this room. And then there's people all over the world, they're coming to look at these paintings. And you think, okay, look, here we are. We're in the richest city in the world, prime, low, prime real estate, 
in this unbelievably expensive museum, in this sealed room. Mm -hmm. The paintings are worth $3.6 billion, and people are making pilgrimages from all over the world just to look at them. It's like, what the hell's going on? It's like, yeah, no kidding. What the hell's going on? There's beauty in those paintings. Mm. There's beauty, and it's magnificent. And part of what it does is say, you aren't who you should be. That's what beauty does to you. It's like, you aren't, that's why you're intimidated by a beautiful woman, mm. like a staggeringly beautiful woman. It's like, oh my God, you know, attracted for sure, but definitely intimidated. It's like, well, that's because you aren't who you could be. Beauty does that to you. Because, uh, so, uh, because I'm not who I could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, because beauty has that contrast. It's like, oh, because, oh, mm -hmm. wow, they're that beautiful, then it uh, suddenly look what I am. Look who Which then brings us to the subject, which is probably the most difficult of all related to beauty, which we're still in the beauty is frightening category, and that is human beauty. And human beauty and the human body are perhaps the most fearful territory of all. And it's amazing everything that, that uh, it's like a battleground, what it all means. First of all, there's a question these days that people ask, does it even exist? Uh, people talk so much about, well, this is just like a biological urge. You see this, you want to go mating, blah, blah, blah. Uh, other people, it's like, it's a way to sell products. It's a way to, to uh, get people to do things. Um, the beauty industry is massive, massive. I don't think we understand beauty very well at all. And yet we all see it. We all come in contact with it. So there's also the loss of beauty as a result of the kind of misguided notions of equality and demo, uh, democratization. So that there's like a body acceptance movement where women who are absolutely unhealthy looking, <coughs> weight-wise, are saying to themselves, but I'm beautiful. And it's kind of strange, because they're essentially justifying their unhealthiness. Now, I'm overweight, you know, by several pounds. But I'm not going to pretend like I'm not, you know. I'm not going to act like somehow I'm, I am just the same as a guy who's 25 years old in the peak of his condition, or, or the way I was at 25 years old. We see all these images in our advertising for the longest time, we'd see images of women, seductive, fashion, fantasy, fantasy beauty. Then later they started figuring out they could also kind of get men. So they'd sh show pictures of men on ripped abs, you know, like, you know, and then they'd put like, you know, musk, sort of, you know, whatever scent they have. It's always kind of like musk. And they get us to think about the way we look. But that doesn't mean there isn't such a thing as beauty. One of my problems with... Uh, Naomi Wolf's book, the, uh, the Beauty Myth, is that by the time you're reading it, she basically says that all, all the human beauty and the, and the drive towards it is all based on, you know, essentially it's, it's capitalist exploitation, male patriarchy, such like that. But in the end, it's like beauty just evaporates, the actual beauty. And so that you're left saying to yourself, well, we really shouldn't try to be beautiful. We shouldn't try to live in a beautiful manner. And, and what we should do is you end up going back to the self-expression stuff or, you know, the daily life we live in. Uh, it, it's, or you just end up, exp ex as in the art world, anything can be art, anything can be beauty. But there are questions involved with this. Why have women been used so often in history to represent humanity through their beauty? Dr. Rickmacher gives a very interesting answer to this question in his uh, series of lectures on beauty. It, it, and he talks about, he spends quite a while on it. I would look up those lectures, a series from Westminster downstairs. But he, he deals with the fact that in a way, women's beauty represents humanity uh, in a very certain kind of a way. But are all bodies and faces equal? Hardly. Let me go back to the uh, guy that I was uh, uh, told you I had met. And if you don't want to look at this, I can understand. But let me just tell you something. I found a, a face on the internet of very, very similar to the guy I met. This is hideous. So if you want, I'm going to pick this up and walk it around in a moment. If you don't want to look, fine, don't look. But I want you to know one thing. This is a human being. And when I, I was hitchhiking, I was around 21 years old, stuck out my thumb, 
sky, and kind of like a, a long, back then there was really long station wagons, had like a protective, you couldn't really see into the vehicle. I, I hopped into the vehicle, sat down, and he was sitting this close to me. And I had no chance to uh, do anything but just kind of like... It, one thing I've discovered about both the most beautiful and the most hideous people I've ever met is they don't come into focus immediately. Not the way you all do. We are all most, mostly pretty much in the middle. Somewhere in a spectrum in the middle. We're all actually pretty much on the upper end of the scale as I look around. I don't see anyone on the lower end at all here. We're all pretty nice looking. We've got good health. You know, people my age would have been practically uh, thinking about, you know, early death uh, not too many years ago. I'm 63. But I don't look like I'm going to die tomorrow, do I? So, um, but this, what I saw was a man who had no nose. His teeth stuck out and were horribly disfigured. He had no ears. His face was raw looking. He had a scruff of a beard. I mean, the, guy, the picture I'm about to show you could actually be the same man. I don't know. But, you know, he stopped and picked me up hitchhiking. And I don't think my life's been the same since then. And, like I said, after that I started asking questions about this stuff. Because I said, why has no one talked about this? Why are we afraid of talking? But then that led to the other side of the equation. But let me just walk this around. So if you don't want to look, you can close your eyes or whatever. But that's a real human being. I've never seen anyone more hideous. This looks almost exactly like the person I saw. Never seen anything more hideous in my life. And especially the fact that I just came up to that person. Just super close. And the guy talked normally. So, kind of living in But like I said, that affected me. And you know what I realized at that point? There's an end to the scale. People aren't, don't all look the same. Absolutely. Later, while living in New York City, I had the opposite experience. Uh, there's actually a doctor, this guy, Stephen Marcord, who was like, uh, ironically, he was like a plastic surgeon, which I think is funny. because he, But he devised this scale where he gave all these people a test, and there's about, I think it's around 16 faces on the scale, ranging from, well, he just asked people to arrange them, and almost everybody arranged these faces in the same order. And there's a few de de deviations, but they were all women's faces, ranging from someone who was just like extraordinarily beautiful to someone who hardly even looked human because of the deformities. But interestingly enough, everyone he gave these faces to pretty much arranged them in the same order. We see beauty. And here's the thing. So, one day, uh, I, I lived in New York City. Now, in New York City, you're going to see something you generally don't see every day, and that's you're going to see models. And um, it was the early 90s, and I was in, uh, mid-90s, probably about 95 or so. And one day, the model Christy Turlington walked into the night. I was working in a record store. Uh, and what's interesting is, at that point, uh, many people would look back, and if they were to say, at that point, they were using the phrase supermodel to really describe supermodels as opposed to just any model. And it was really interesting what happened in the store. There was perhaps six or seven people in the store. You could feel everything change in the room. It's like everyone started like, you know, adjusting yourself, uh, seeing how you fit, m m uh, male, female. Because you just realize someone just walked into the room who does not look like us at all. I mean, there was no question. She was just like that pure. Now, I'm just talking purely appearances here. And the question is, what is going on under the appearances? What is beauty? But, but here's the thing. So there's de that, and I, uh, uh, there's definitely a scale there. Um, I have a very good friend who is also a fashion model in New York City. 
Her name is Sarah. One day she decided to visit me in Alaska. Now, Sarah gave up modeling around 1989 at the age of 19. Had she gone on, she would possibly be as recognized as many of those fashion models. She's that beautiful. She arrived in Alaska to visit me with her. Uh, at that time, he was around 12-year-old son. So she was probably around 30-something at that point. Everybody in town asked me who that was. She, you know, there, there's standard beautiful girls in that town, but this was in a totally different league, you know. And why? Because they suddenly, I, I'm sure it had uh, the man with uh, the name of this disease is Porphyria, had, had uh, that man walked into the town, everyone also would have reacted. We react at the extremes. Something gets to us in the appearances. Uh, sometimes so strong it makes you not understand the character of the person. But um, interestingly enough, when you get to the subject of male beauty, I mean, you get to questions like, you know, uh, I remember not thinking at all about rip dabs or anything like that. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger was like, no one wanted to be like this guy because he was like a freak, you know. But later, it was the movie Thelma and Louise. I remember the moment. When the movie was first released, there's a scene where Brad Pitt takes off his shirt, and I was with a full audience, and you could hear everyone go like, oh. why? Well, I know what, what a lot of the guys are thinking. It's like, oh my God, have I got to do this now? Because with Arnold Schwarzenegger, you could kind of say, like, this is for muscle-building freaks. But not this guy. This guy looked normal, except he was, like, extraordinarily well-defined. Plus, he was Brad Pitt. It was the first time anyone noticed, and really noticed, Brad Pitt in a movie. And believe me, they noticed him. He became a superstar almost immediately. But there was something in that taking off the shirt moment. There, everyone was like, ugh. Interestingly enough, if you want to find really handsome men, go to Alaska. I'm serious. I know so many guys who are there who are just like, you look at them and they're just like, they just feel like, but you know, they're the kind of guys who, they work outdoors. They do uh, carpentry. They're raft guides. You know, they, uh, but, but they just look like, if you were just say, like, beautiful man. There he is. But he looks rugged, too. He's not just, you know, he's not just like, doesn't look like a model. He looks like a guy. Interestingly enough, who they're married to. They're not married to those fashion models. They're married to women who often have a lot of character or who are very kind or, and are very resourceful, at least in Alaska, you know? So it's not like, you got to have the character and you've got to be resourceful and, and being kind is a real help. It wasn't the most beautiful girls in town. It was the ones who, they had almost like, yeah, I can deal with that. Interestingly enough, the whole thing with models, I read a book in the uh, late 90s called Models by a guy, Michael Gross, and he discusses the rise of modeling as a career and he points out that over, uh, over uh, what is it, uh, over 200 models, say, he discusses in the book, two or three have good marriages. The rest do not. Interesting. Okay, well, let me go on here. Uh, there's a lot of questions related to beauty. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a whole discussion of what beauty is in the Bible. And I can see if I go through everything I've got here, I'm going to do it. Let's put it to you this way, without going into all the, the verses and such. A lot of people will pull out that verse immediately. It says, you know, your beauty does not come from outward adornment and braided hair. But nevertheless, in Exodus, we have garments for the priests made for beauty. Uh, we also have the descriptions of beauty in the Song of Solomons, which range from real descriptions of physical, uh, the physical body to saying that this is also terrible, fearful, because it, it recognizes something there. Um, there's also the question of, of uh, the lust. Beauty it sometimes provokes lust in people and our desire to possess it. There's a difference between lust and love. Lust takes. Love gives. And then there's the question of how should, how, how should a person who is beautiful act? Uh, it's interesting, the verse, to whom much is given, much is required. Um, I would say that graciously, with humility, as Ingrid Bergman, who often was told how beautiful she was, the great actress, 
she would just say, it's like, you know, people say, you're so beautiful. And she really is. If you look at her films, more than many uh, uh, movie stars, she's not simply the, uh, the, the facade of the sexy woman or something. She's really got a character that's beautiful, in, at least in the films. I don't know who, who, what she was really like. But this is an interesting story. People would say, how, I say, you know, you're so beautiful. They'd be in awe of her. And she would just say, isn't that lucky? Because she recognized she got the genetic card. And the question is how to live it. And the answer is graciously and humbly. And to, to provide something for others. To recognize that, you know, you, she's certainly not the person at the other end of the scale. You know? And how do we react without envy? That's one big problem. People, envy rips apart how we look at people. Uh, without idolatry, either. To idolize these people. Realizing that these people are human, too. That we all have insecurities. And in fact, like I said about models, just because you're beautiful doesn't mean you live a good life and have good relationships. Because who's going to approach those women? The guys who think they have something to prove. And the good guys tend to be like, I don't know, I'm not good enough for this. But whereas the other ones are like, yeah, her, I'm going to get her. You know, you don't want to be around those guys. They're not good guys. So beauty is dangerous. That's the next one. It inspires envy, for instance, human beauty. Tarkovsky again says, The beautiful is hidden from the eyes of those who are not searching for truth, for whom it is contraindicated. But the profound lack of spirituality of those people who see art and condemn it, the fact that they are near, neither willing nor ready to consider the meaning and the aim of their existence in any higher sense, is often masked by the vulgarly simplistic cry, I don't like it, it's boring. Uh... It is not a point that one can argue, but but it like it like the utterance of a man born blind who is told about a rainbow. He simply remains deaf to the pain undergone by the artist in order to share with others the truth he has reached. Interestingly enough, many people think that the opposite of beauty is something like horror and ugliness. You know, I just showed you a very horrifying image of a man. And I've told you about uh, something you could see more often on a magazine cover or something, a very beautiful woman. But those two things have much more in common, because they are both real and human, than does the opposite of beauty. And interestingly enough, it's uh, Roger Scruton who really brought this to light for me. He says that the opposite of beauty is kitsch. And what does he mean by that? Kitsch is hard to define, but it's easy to see. Popular culture essentially now is built around kitsch. Kitsch comes from a German word. Its origins in German are not exactly clear where it comes from, but it could also be translated in English as cheesiness, tackiness, trashiness. Popular culture, let's see, it, 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 it's in art and other objects that appeal to popular taste rather than to any sense of beauty, of true beauty. Uh, the word was first used in the 19th century by uh, critics to describe aesthetics that favored exaggerated sentimentality and melodrama. Such objects can also be appreciated in a kind of a knowing, ironic, or humorous way. That would be the postmodern take. So you see something it's knowingly, like, for instance, uh, I don't know, a little honey thing. It's got a little bear on it. It's made of plastic. That's pure kitsch. It's there to go, oh. I got a little honey bear, you know. Or, you know, I hate to talk about the... I won't talk about the paintings of Thomas Kincaid, uh, which are Christian kitsch. But, I mean, basically, when I go to churches these days, most of the music is kitsch. It's sentimental, overly sentimental, and just goes on and on and on. There isn't much there related to the beautiful at all. And this is what Scruton says. And this, when I read this, this made a lot of sense. He says, simply put, Kitsch is not, in the first instance, an artistic phenomenon, but a disease of faith. Think about that for a minute. These cute little things we surround ourselves are not simply an artistic thing. They are a disease of faith. Kitsch begins in doctrine and ideology and spreads from there to infect the entire world of culture. The disnification of art is simply one aspect of the disnification of faith. And both involve a profanation of the highest levels. 
Kitsch, in the case of Disney, reminds us this is not an excess of feeling, but a deficiency of feeling. In other words, all these cute little things, all these nice, happy things, the baubles. I mean, it's amazing to walk into people's houses and all the stuff on the walls. It's just pure kitsch. This, this kind of like taste, it's just this, this modern pop stuff. But it could be fan art, fan fiction. It could be, uh, you know, I mean, so much of, of what we consume now is kitschy. Uh, uh, and he says, so the world of kitsch is in a manner, a certain measure, a heartless world in which emotion is directed away from its proper target towards sugary stereotypes, permitting us to pay passing tribute to love and sorrow without the trouble of feeling them. I like that. Uh, permitting us to pay a passing tribute to love and sorrow without the trouble of feeling them. It is no accident that the arrival of Kitsch on the stage of history coincided the hitherto unimaginable horrors of trench warfare, of the Holocaust, of the Gulag, all of them fulfilling the prophecy that Kitsch proclaims, which is the transformation of the human being into a doll, which in one moment we cover with kisses and in the next moment tear to shreds. This is fascinating to me. Uh, I just recently, dis this was in his book on beauty. For those of us who live in the aftermath of the kitsch epidemic, therefore, art has acquired a new importance. It is the real presence of our spiritual ideals. That is why art matters. Without the conscious pursuit of beauty, we risk falling into a world of addictive pleasures and routine desecration, uh, a world without in which the worthwhileness of human life is no longer clearly perceivable. Beauty is a mystery. There is a temptation to turn the appearances into the meaning of everything, to worship the thing over the creator. Consider the concept of lust over love, as I just said, taking rather than giving. And yet somehow there is indeed something to perceive, something very important. Consider this Swiss landscape that you are in. What does it mean to you? What is that thing that is so, it, it grabs you? I can't, you can't put it into words. Each of it will ex, uh, us will experience it in a different way. But there's something out there. Um, why does the natural world impress us so? Or some works of art? Or a human face? Why do we feed on the appearances of the world around us, get our nutrition from these things? So it's not just simply utilitarian. Why do children seem so beautiful to us? Finally, beauty is a relationship. Beauty is a personal relationship. It hap often happens in a moment, or even in a reflection of a memory that we weren't expecting to be meaningful. You go back to something, and suddenly you realize, oh, that's what happened. Then. Something very beautiful. Um, art, in all of its definitions, is in one way or another express uh, it is expressing, I think, one's individual connection to the beauty of meaning and to seek to share it as we explore it. Tarkovsky says the allotted function of art, and I, I read this before, is not, as is assumed, to put across ideas, to propagate thoughts, or even to serve as, as an example. The aim of art is to prepare a person for death, to plow and harrow his soul, rending it capable of turning to good. Art affirms all that is best in man. Hope, faith, love, beauty, prayer what he dreams of and what he hopes for. What is art? Like a declaration of love, the, uh, the consciousness of our dependence on each other, a confession, an unconscious act that nonetheless reflects the true meaning of life, love, and sacrifice. So, going back to the guy who picked me up. Interestingly enough, I got a ride from someone, I, I, I was just completely speechless. I said something I was very, very much... Uh, in the Jesus movement at the time, and when he let me off, I couldn't talk to him. I was just like... Uh, but at the end, I just said, Jesus loves you, and I got out. And later, I found out, I got picked up by someone who had just seen him getting his driver's license photo at the DMV, because you don't miss a person like this. I found out more about him later. He was a, a Catholic who... This thing had suddenly just come upon him. He, are, he had children and a family. He was a photographer. He took pictures of dogs. He wore a hood. And I had another friend who had him as a dental patient. Yeah, I can't even imagine that. Because the teeth are one of the things that get weird. It's an allergy to the sun. 
But, you know, I thought about, why did this guy pick me up? And I'm really glad he did. Why? It's an interesting thought. I don't know the answer. He was just probably picking me up. You know. But then again, what has Christy Turlington done? Yeah, she's put out yoga videos. She's uh, got, you know, told people about, you know, don't eat meat. Kind of big political whatever. But really, what has she done? So maybe in the end, he is more beautiful than her. So, finally, maybe we should live lives that allow for the possibility of beauty to escape the deadening effects of utilitarianism, to res resist the extreme egalitarian notion that ultimately every person, every image is identical, the same somehow, to look at things beyond the screenal world that we're presented with, uh, to make time for both the appreciation of beauty in others and to create objects and spaces that are more giving than taking. Uh, love is not about whether others see our self-expression, but it is about our sharing and what we have to give to help others to understand the difficulties and sometimes the impossibilities of life. So again, I, I'm just going to ask this. What is the beauty of holiness? It's a phrase that shows up again and again. Holiness is, to be holy is to be something set apart. And I would say that beauty always is. It's always a personal response. I can't say, look, do you see how beautiful that is out there? And you all look and see how beautiful I see it to be. It is a personal thing. It is set apart. And so there is a connection between beauty and holiness. I, don't, I can't say any much more beyond it than that. But I'll stop there. So... Any questions? Well, I, I would say um, that I think it's interesting to try to think about beauty as something that you can find anywhere you are. Maybe you're in a city, maybe you're in a small poor country of Africa or something. I mean, I was in the slums in Africa before, and... Um, it was called Kabira, and there was nothing. I mean, it was stirred in the, you know, the, the excrements and everything were coming through the middle of, you know, right down where we were walking, basically. But the children were so wonderful and had such beautiful smiles and um, wanted to play with us, and we weren't really supposed to touch them because they were probably ridden with diseases, but... Anyway, um, we couldn't help it because they were so beautiful and just the way they were. I, I don't know. I think there's beauty that you can find in people and places. And, and it, almost any person, I mean every person, I think there's something so beautiful about them because they were made by God. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we can pay attention a little more around us, even if we're not in a beautiful place like this, even if we're in just a very uh, seemingly not natural looking place, I think we can even find some beauty there. Um, so I think it, it's, it's a matter of keeping your eyes open mm -hmm. and trying to, trying to look for it in unexpected places. Yeah, I completely agree with you, too. Uh, in New York City, I used to be sometimes overwhelmed by weeds growing through the bricks on the walls and stuff, because it was like the only nature I would get. And uh, However, we wouldn't want to make a world like the slums you were walking through. You know, there's a, there's a deprivation of beauty in the world that we sometimes make. And so while I could, for instance, find beauty in a McDonald's cup, for instance, say if I, I have a paper cup and I use it to feed someone who's, you know, give water to someone who's dying of thirst. That would be a beautiful thing to do with it. Nevertheless, the McDonald's cup itself, not so much. So we can find it in, but it's just like finding it in the crucifixion. Doesn't mean the crucifixion, and if you were there, you wouldn't be going like, oh, how beautiful. You'd be like, oh, this would be horrifying, terrifying. But I think yeah, it's an interesting tension, though. And I think we have to find it in... I think each person here has beauty within them, obviously. You know, 
and not just physical. But uh, there is an old saying that says something like, uh, God gives you the face you have until you're 40, and after that you have the face you created for yourself. And I think that says something about the conflicts and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, I think we all start off, in a sense, with a, a, a deck of cards, a, a series of, uh, it's like you get it delivered a hand, and then you play it. And some people have all sorts of strange things in their hand. So, but I think beauty, I think, I, I mean, when I look at, say, 12-year-olds, almost every 12-year-old looks really beautiful, you know. Then I look at 20-year-olds and I start going, like, hmm, something's changed. They don't, why don't they all look the same anymore? Because maybe they don't act the same. I don't know. I guess what I was saying is sort of, it's not really so much on the exterior, it's more of something that you see in that person's eyes. Yeah, but I would also say there is this desire, and I think Christians do this more than anyone, to say there is nothing in the exterior. That is to say that uh, something looking a certain way doesn't particularly matter, and yet I would argue we can't live that way. And what those people need is jeepers. Can we help in their environment to make it more beautiful? And that would include uh, the physical appearances of things, and to clean up the the excrement and, and whatever, you know. So um, I, I, that's how I look at it, though. But I think there is beauty in everything. Uh, you can find it. But it's, sometimes it's, there is also darkness and horror there as well. Yeah? Um, so one of the thinkers you mentioned several times is uh, Tarkovsky? Tarkovsky. T-A-R-K-O-V-S-K-Y. Andre Tarkovsky. T A R what? K O V S K Y. Cool. And his um, book, Sculpting in Time, that's okay. the one where he writes about his ideas on art and beauty okay. and time. So I think he said that um, the more self expression that you aim for, the more you lose understanding of beauty. That, that I don't know if I'd put it exactly that way, but what he was saying is basically that somewhere art took a wrong turn and it became more about self-expression than beauty. Okay. And I think his goal was to get people to think about the meaning of beauty. And, and again, it's not just simply, and as he said, that remark about shunning, you know, art doesn't shun the dirt in order to make the beautiful object. So we have to include in it... Uh, the things which are not uh, necessarily pretty, you know. Mm-hmm. So. so he's not saying, or is he saying that self-expression is counter to beauty? I would say that, uh, it, he says it best when he says the artist is a servant. So that what I express and whatever I do, certainly is self-expression. But it doesn't do me any good simply to, ex- I mean, Believe me, I've met artists in New York City uh, and other places who have done some crazy things to express themselves, uh, some exactly involving uh, the image of, you know, human excrement. And I would say, like, no, I'm sorry. That does not add to the world. The, the, and the effect of that, per- that, I'm thinking of a certain piece of performance art, does not make it a better world, even though you are ripping apart the illusions of something. So to, uh, I think it means that there should be a responsibility that the artist has. That's how I interpret it. Okay. That I'm not alone in this world. I'm not simply making stuff for myself. But I'm making stuff as part of uh, a group, a community. You know, I think of the people I know who will see what I've done. You know? Yeah. That's a really good question, because there is that quote, uh, truth is beauty, and such like, beauty is truth. They are connected. They are like things, there are these things that are like truth, beauty, joy, peace, that are absolutely essential for living, and at the same time, very hard to define. And I don't think they're in the category of things. I think they are in the category of relationships. And so that, uh, so that's why they're hard to see. It's really hard to talk about beauty without talking about something specific. 
and finding it in something specific, in a specific relationship. You know, although we do like uh, there is a temptation uh, in beauty to put the image in place of the uh, the interior of the relationship to make that image an idol. Um, and these mountains can be an idol for people who come here on vacation, you know. But I think that they are very close together. And yeah, I, mean, I would I would suggest that there is an Irish musicologist I've forgotten his name, unfortunately. I heard the quote ten years ago or so. But, but he's saying that uh, that art can point to truth but it can do so using beauty or using ugliness. Or, yeah. yeah. Like, like you're touching on that, that ugly things can be very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. like, like the not so attractive uh, like pickup driver. Yes, not so. But yeah. his action was very beautiful. Mm -hmm. But picking up somebody who's is not necessarily beautiful, but the fact that he was so yeah. attractive yeah. made it beautiful. Well, it is a very specific thing. Had he picked up another person besides me, they might have been scarred for their lives. I'm serious, you know. That's how what kind of level we're talking. Well, my, 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 my point is, maybe, maybe we should separate um, beauty or find another word. We can discuss the use of sublime. I'm not too happy about the next movement. Right, right. Uh, yes, yes, I understand well, we that. Say, we, could, we could say that attractiveness, ugliness can lead to truth. But what if we said something like only something is only beautiful if it is closely connected to truth? I, yeah, I would say this, that that sounds right to me. So the, mo the moment. But attractiveness is separated from, from truth. It's not so beautiful anymore. Right. And that's what you see in advertising. Is that, yeah, exactly. is that you see a very beautiful girl stripped down, put, usually put into a certain kind of environment that is very graphic in a certain way to isolate her, much as a painting can be isolated in a gallery to become like an idol. You know, I mean, what is people's relationship to the Mona Lisa? Undoubtedly, the Mona Lisa is a very powerful and beautiful work of art. And yet the way it's treated is almost as some sort of uh, Id Id idolatrous fetish object. I think Mona Lisa is, is actually really, really interesting. But the reason why it's such a beautiful painting mm -hmm. is because she's not a particular beautiful woman. Exactly. She really isn't. Yeah. But he paints her, so she just looks right. amazingly beautiful. He, well, makes, he makes the ordinary looks extraordinary. Right, and I didn't. So he's, he's in a sense he's right. painting her, her eyes. So mm -hmm. he's, well, he's painting her soul. Right. Well, I didn't have time to get into. I mean, there's so much more here, and that's what I was saying about the beginning. It's just like I'm just going to touch on things and may, might bring up some other stuff. But for instance, Rembrandt is amazing because Rembrandt discovers that you can paint an old woman or or uh, an old man or himself looking both totally honestly like he looks because he doesn't paint himself attractive at the end. And yet, it's totally beautiful painting because it's connected to truth and it is connected to appearances as well. And there's something about beauty that is connected to the appearance of things. So it's not simply the inside. You could say the inside is the truth. So that, but the beauty has to do with its appearance or it's the way, you know, for instance, in art, where you come to music and music is always the thing that yeah, I can recognize beautiful music, at least in my relationship to it, but I can't see it, and yet it makes, a, I, it provokes vision, it provokes thoughts. So, that's a, it's a complicated thing there. But, yeah. Um, something with the Mona Lisa, I think is kind of indicative, and goes back to the over-commercialization of the way we think we're supposed to appreciate beauty. The Mona Lisa really wasn't even that appreciated. It was just a piece of art that was stolen and they didn't even realize it had been stolen for a couple days or weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was that story. It was a cool story and everyone's like, oh, I want to go see the painting when they recovered it. Of like, oh, how insignificant was this painting that was in this building that when it got stolen, the guards didn't even realize it had been stolen. Then it 
all the publications, and so everyone wanted to go see that. And you can go to the Louvre, and there's thousands of other pieces that are much more impactful than that. So I think it actually kind of goes counter to what, like, you were, you've made a statement, or you had a quote from a person um, saying that there was, like, over commercialization. You didn't, I think you said you didn't agree with that. But I think that that actually cut does kind of show that there is an over commercialization, and we kind of migrate towards what we think we're told to be mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. And I would push back on that notion of the Christian viewpoint of being able to find beauty in something, like sitting down and reading like Henry Nowen and people who do put themselves out, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, things who kind of are able to step down and see beauty at a more personal level. Mm -hmm. That is us pushing back on the oversimplification and commercialization of our society that tells us this is a spectrum. Whereas we can reject that spectrum of like a physical beauty, but we, we can find that in everything. Um, and so I think the Mona Lisa is, a, is a, an example of just kind of like, why is that important? I think the majority is, it just shows that we, we just flock to what we're told to flock to. Well, yeah, that's definitely a case. Uh, and, and I would agree totally. So, like I said, I, there's a lot of things in here. There's a lot of bumps and hidden turns and such. One thing I didn't mention is, for instance, I told you about my friend and or uh, this model I saw. Well, you know what? Everybody can see that this person is beautiful, in, at least in the physical appearance. Just as everyone can go to the Grand Canyon and go like, wow, that's a big canyon. But that doesn't mean everyone can appreciate those things. And uh, sometimes just to see the beauty of one leaf falling off a tree, you have to just stop and watch it. And it's not something that's going to call a lot of attention to itself. And everyone, you know, a lot of people are just going to walk by it. But it's still really, really beautiful. And, um, and I think people are like that too. We all have that thing inside of us that if, if you get to know anyone, you'll start to see uh, this thing that I think is God has put in all of us that is truly beautiful. But it takes... I, I kind of got rushed a little at the end because I saw my time slipping away, so I, I didn't express this probably the way I wanted to. But but it, there is a tension between the inside and the outside. And the thing which everybody can see is actually much harder to see. And so what they've done with the Mona Lisa is it's on the cover of everything related to the Louvre. It's, it's their selling point. And everyone, therefore, goes to it, exactly like you're saying. But that means... As Walker Percy has a great article, uh, essay called "The Loss of the Creature," you know he talks about and he talks about trying to find the Grand Canyon and how hard it is because once you get there, there's a big sign at the entrance that says Grand Canyon. You already know what you're going to expect. You're not going to be surprised. It's not like you're going to be. Uh, I believe it was the conquistador Card Cardenas who was just coming along with his group, and all of a sudden, bam. This thing was right in front of them. They didn't have any word for it. They probably eventually said, hey, it's Grand Canyon. But, but still, imagine that. No one told you this thing is there, and then it's there. You know? So it's hard for us to see the thing that everyone, everyone is telling you to look at. And it's hard to actually take it in. I am convinced, when I was just at the Louvre, I did not see the Mona Lisa, even though I was in the room with it, saw it behind the glass, saw everyone take it. But I didn't see it. I didn't really see it. I just saw the the, fr the feeding frenzy. It was like pigeons with popcorn, you know. So, any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. How would you respond to someone who says beauty is just an eye to beholder? Well, there is that personal aspect, but like I said, there's a reason why we all go wow at the Grand Canyon. There's a reason why we use certain kinds of faces for advertising. I exploit certain faces is because we can see these things very clearly. So that kind of beauty, which is definitely real, uh, just as there is on the other end, I mean, if you were in the presence of the guy I met, you would not be saying, oh, what a beautiful man. I see his beauty. You wouldn't, that would not be your first thought. It takes a while to think about that. Um, and it's even tougher when you're around, for instance, people who are really malevolent. You know, because then you're dealing with people who are actively, you know, well, I wouldn't even know what to think if I was in the presence of someone who tortured people for a living. You know, uh, 
And maybe there was a handsome person <laughs> doing it, you know. Uh, you know, the, this is the kind of world uh, Rookmacher at one point says, you know, we generally have in mythologies uh, that the old evil uh, witch-like thing is an old crone. And there's a reason for that. It's because that we, we make the story to resemble the, uh, the, the object in, in mythology. But he says, but if you want real horror, make it a really beautiful woman who is very evil. He says, now it's even much stronger. So there is this whole tension in our lives between the appearances and the realities. And, but I think many people have said, therefore, only the realities are important. But I'm saying, no, the appearances have a real effect upon us. And beauty is somewhere between the two. To understand beauty is to somewhere understand that zone in between I mean, it wasn't an illusion that I walked up to the Pieta and went, had tears in my eyes. Uh, that was inspired by the work that went on in that, along with my personal thoughts and, and uh, feelings at that moment. You know, and the fact that it was made really well was not an illusion. You know. <clears throat> Yeah. The, beauty, the beauty of a person often has very little to do with appearance. Uh, yeah, and yet at the same time, you have to see something in them. Right. You're saying <laughs> yeah. physical appearance. Yeah, but I'm saying that, that there is, however, there is a, a physical beauty. And our relationship to it uh, we may find that a person who is extremely beautiful is then like, I mean, there's plenty of fashion models that I know of uh, who have terrible personalities, you know. But there is a connection. You know, and I'm saying there's kind of a mystery there of how it works. So it's you, you don't get attracted to someone because of, you know, blindly. That is to say, uh, truly blindly. You don't do this and go like, oh, I just think you're really a beautiful person. No, you see the person. And the more you see them, the more you see what their face means. I think as you get, at least for me, I think as you get older, <clears throat> you look beyond the physical appearance. I would agree. But I would also say it's still there. And the danger is to, see, I think, uh, Christians have often said physical beauty doesn't matter. They often say this in the construction of their churches, that physical beauty doesn't matter. Therefore, they end up creating these utilitarian monsters, particularly <coughs> mega churches, where it's all uh, basically things that were cost effective, that how do we get the most people in here? How do more people listen? And truthfully, no one wants to go into those buildings to appreciate them. No one is going saying, you know, to some huge megachurch in Dallas, Texas and saying, I want to see that. They'd much rather come to a place they don't understand at all, some cathedral in Paris, even though they may not understand what they're looking at. But I'm saying, what I'm saying is that the appearance is part of it. But however, it could be more beautiful if the appearance was, say, defective or deformed and you were able to understand the person and... Here's the thing. Not everyone who has like, got serious uh, physical defects is a, is a genuinely nice human being. You know? So I'm just saying that, that there is a meaning to appearances. Otherwise, we wouldn't see beauty in anything. I guess I would disagree. Well, who got attracted to the person they married without considering the way they loved? I have blind friends who use well, the word beauty. Hmm? It's attractiveness, right? Like, I feel like you're talking about, like, the scale of attractiveness. So, like, someone that's, like, very attractive or someone who's, like, unattractive. And, like, the depth of beauty comes with the depth of insight. Like, if I look at, like, the mountains, I can say, like, that's, like, an attractive landscape. And the depth of the beauty that that causes me to feel then turns into, wow, that's really beautiful, right? And if I meet a person that's extremely attractive, I can say, like, I recognize that, like, this is an attractive person. And I get to know them, and the depth of beauty comes with that connection of relationship, right? And I feel like that's kind of what you've alluded to in, like, the, the act of someone who's maybe not as attractive picking you up. 
that can be that stance of that action itself is beautiful and you can see beauty in that even though on that scale of attractiveness they might not fall as high as someone else but then again that's like how you choose to see it I feel like beauty comes from like the depth of a relationship versus the attractiveness like I can yeah, see I what agree. you're saying but I, I agree that it comes from the depth of a relationship but it, there is this Gnostic tendency to cut off the appearances of things to make it so that Oh, it's just, I just like you for you who you are. You know, what, but what does that mean? Is not the face and the way it is shaped who you are also? I think it, if you base how you view someone on their attractiveness, then wouldn't that be going to, to say that you like, don't stand to see that person? Like, the person is a whole person. So if you only see them for their appearance, that's wrong. But if you can see them for all of who they are. But just because oh, yeah. I might be unattractive on the outside, does that take away from my beauty then? Am I no longer as beautiful because well, the outside of me isn't as beautiful as someone else? No, but you are attractive on the outside. I don't think there's anyone here who would say anything else. That is to say, we see your character through your face. Sure, but if I'm deformed, then is my character less than because my physical appearance? You, one of the people in this world that I probably consider the most saint-like was the elephant man, who had, again, you, you guys are being really nice and talking about less attractive. The guy who picked me up was not less attractive. He was hideous. The elephant man was not less attractive. He was hideous. I mean, genuinely. If, if Women could not be in the same room with him without screaming. He was overwhelmed. The first time someone spent time with him, as a particularly a woman, and did not show this this like absolute appalled character. But he never. This is why I love his his personality. He never held it against them. He said, well, "Of course, I'm I'm ugly. It must be tough to be around me." Yeah, Pio. I think when we talk about these things as attractiveness, puffliness, and so on and so forth, I think you're right when you're talking about uh, utilitarianism mm -hmm. causing problems for us because utilitarianism separates function from beauty. I don't think they should be separated. They, they actually should, should, should work exactly. together. Some of this, I know as a graphic designer, uh, in, in, in practical use, for example, if I if I design a logo for someone, uh, my client might might say to me, "Oh, I'm not really sure I like the typeface," and I say, "Well, whether it's whether you whether your taste fits into it actually means less than what kind of value you add to it over time." by the content of your branding package or the content of your actual product or service or whatever. Think of a name like Amazon. Why would you choose a name like Amazon for an online service? It's absolutely silly. Why would you think of the Amazon jungle and, and buy books online as, as I started out? It's absolutely insane. It doesn't make any sense at all. Well, it does make sense in the long run because the value gradually gets added to the name, so to speak. So, so while we um, while we can say that, that I don't have a, a particular uh, attractive beard, let's say, well, if I treat you nicely over a couple of years, you might actually add value to my beard and recognize me by my beard and say, oh, hey, that's a really attractive beard. Mm -hmm. But it has less to do with it actually being pretty, or more of it having meaning and content within the relational, as, as you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even things that are unattractive becomes meaningful and, and beautiful over time as meaning gets added to it. Uh, and maybe that is what the new heaven and new earth will be, was to, will be to take that which we have soiled in this world and to give it the meaning that it could have had or, or should have. Yes, and I, th and I think that's, that's, that's very, very relevant, because that's, that's where I can say that the kingdom of God is within me, mm -hmm. and people will recognize it, whether I have an ugly beard or not, mm -hmm. over time. They will recognize it. But I will also be able to recognize it in other people then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So in the in the case of the elephant man, in the case of the the hideous uh, driver, you know, we can recognize Christ within him. Mm -hmm. And even though it's just a concept, it's even though it's just an idea for us, the, the fact that we're called to love other people as we do it, mm -hmm. I bet you that over time you would find him less hideous. Oh yeah, absolutely. And 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 that goes along with what you're saying too, uh, Julie. And and I think that. The, the thing is, when you get to the subject of human beauty, it's a hot, hot topic. I mean, just because we are all connected to it. You know, how do we look at ourselves in the mirror versus how we're told we should be versus how we're also told we should be? You know, like there's everyone trying to say this or that, you know. Well, you know, one thing I'm not a fan of is uh, needless cosmetic surgery. You know, I think a person should grow comfortable in their skin and not feel that that intense pressure that it certainly is felt in some parts of the world to to uh, become uh, you know this perfect image because there is no perfect image apart from Christ you know but yeah um, yeah I don't mean to say that the appearance is all but nor do I need mean to say it is nothing because it, ex for instance, human uh, appearance expresses exactly our character. How do you know what a person looks like? And in those rare cases when someone has some sort of deformity, uh, there was a woman getting on the uh, ferry in Alaska that had like, something this big growing off the side of her neck. And it was tough to look at her, you know, first. But I said, let's look. Let's let's try to find that humanity in her, you know. But it was tough. I, I must admit. Yeah. Um, so what I'm kind of seeing through this conversation um, is that there's there's the beauty of appearances, and then there's the beauty of person, and those two things are related, but also not entirely the same thing. Um, and we find beauty in appearance for all sorts of reasons. Some there's you know okay, well there's the actual beauty that's there. Some are cultural things that we've been taught are beautiful that may or may not be. Um, there's all of the effects of what is picked for beautiful in advertising that affects that kind of first naive glance at a person. And then there's the understand and then we because we're we work fast and we're we simplify things, we then equate that with the person on first glance. And then as we come to know the person more, the aspect of who they are and their character comes as this kind of conversation partner to the to the appearance. And the appearance never becomes not part of it, but sometimes the appearance can then become a symbol for what we understand in the person, and then the interrelation of the two is then what mm -hmm. is beautiful or ugly about the person. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be roughly some of what's... I, that sounds, sounds about right. Is that, it, um, you know, like I was saying about the models, they have a tough time because people... It's easy to turn that kind of person into an idol. Uh, and that is, I think, the, when we talk about, for instance, the objectification of women and things like that, it's n no longer allowing them to be the individual they are, but instead making them their bodily structure. And that is a dark thing to do. However, a person also has a specific appearance. Um, and we have to find a way to interact with each other uh, it's easy when we're all just kind of like, you know, uh, whoever we are, uh, kind of muttly creatures uh, who have a variety of different faces and such. But then it gets tough, too. There's this other part of it that's hard. And, for instance, like I said, sometimes uh, looking in the mirror is not a pleasant experience, and sometimes we spend too much time doing it. And what is the nature of all those selfies? And why are we doing that to ourselves? Why are we looking at ourselves so much? Um, and it's not as simple, why is not a simple answer, you know, but I think we have to question these things. We have to become people full of substance. So I, I do think the interior of a person is important. I would also say, hey, I know my interior, I've got a lot of problems. So I'm not going to tell you that, yeah, if you could just see all the beautiful things in me. No, if you were to see everything in me, there'd be things that make you go, I'm sorry, that's kind of frightening. And I would, the same would be true for all of you. 
there are things about all of us that if you know we were just to somehow be able to expose that interior that is more beautiful than the exterior, then we, there would be moments we would go like, oh, unless we could see it more with the eyes of God, but that's a different discussion. Yeah. Well, one thing I think about sometimes, um, because we are all you know, lacking in something, but when I look at a person or meet a person or uh, try, try to, trying to be that person uh, from you know, through the lens that maybe Christ would look at that person and think, yeah, yeah, there's things that maybe are not so attractive or things that maybe are not um, so great, but um, every one of us is kind of like this block of wood that hasn't been fully carved yet, and mm-hmm. think about that person, how they could could be, like how they were meant to be, and find those, you know, find those things that are beautiful that maybe aren't fully beautiful yet, but it's kind of like, I like to do carving, and so, you know, you see the block of wood, but you see the potential there. And so, you see that maybe it's not fully beautiful yet, but there's something that you know that is kind of like the beginnings of something that could be even more beautiful, and whether that's on the outside or the inside, but mostly I'm thinking about the character and stuff like that, just trying to think of it more like that because because some sometimes it's um, that's the hardest thing to see. So I, I think uh, I think about it because I think how God looks at me and how I view myself is so, you know, lacking. And and yet God looks at me and says I'm beautiful and how I should look at other people that way and not, you know, it's basically because of Christ, I think, that we can maybe look at people and see that beauty that maybe is not fully there yet, but could, is, you know, could be potential, the, the potential. Does that make sense? It does. I also have to keep intent in mind, I think you're right, that we need to look at each other and to say, I look at it as like, what is this person like? What? could I give to them? Who are they? Uh, is there something that I have that might help them in some way? I don't have. To, I don't know if the answer is always yes to that question. Sometimes there are people I don't know how to help at all uh, that I'm confused about. But, um, but then they, I have to put that in tension with verses that say things like, and Jesus saw what was in the hearts of men, that it was not good, that there was evil there. And so that it isn't. I think we live in a time where people want to put a positive spin on everything. I'm not sure the beautiful is always about the positive spin. I think that it's also about. I don't know. There are there is these other things. I think that's why Tarkovsky, who if you look at his films, they're not simplistic little. Um, they're not there to make you feel good. I mean, he really thought about this stuff and. Uh, and I think it's easy for us to want to feel good too much. So I went through some stuff last, not this summer, but the summer before. Didn't feel good at all, but I was uh, kind of open to the experience. I just said, okay, if I have to break, let me break. It's all right. So, uh, because I, I assume that that is the way in which that which is good within me will come out and I will uh, I will go up against the habits and the states of mind that uh, that are really harmful to me which we all have you know so yeah uh, as uncomfortable as I am with the concept of a scale of beauty in humans um, I'm not I understand what you're saying and the fact that like it clearly exists in the way that culture behaves and arranges um, people's appearances but then I feel like humans and and architecture and like because you you use the example of churches mm-hmm. uh, and how beauty was so necessary in churches would you say that the scale for human would be the same for the scale of a building or art as in a, a, a beauty scale or do you think therefore because one's an object and one is well uh, for instance there was the parts there where i was reading where tarkovsky says things like um there are those who don't see or won't see, you know, and I know people who 
you know, the, the financial costs or the, the, the desire to make sure you have a structure which is uh, simply functional would take precedence over any sort of uh, aesthetic uh, considerations at all. I mean, I know people like that in Alaska. But would you apply those same principles to pyramids of people? Uh, well, here's the weird thing about the scale. I, I, like I said, I, there's a lot more here that I could have talked about. I could have made this at least twice as long, this lecture. Uh, the guy who came up with the scale is a plastic surgeon. He often uses this to pressure people into looking better, which is, to me, kind of devious. So he discovered this thing, but he's also got his own issues. Now, when you dig into his life, turns out his mother died of a tremendous deformity. So he's been running from this stuff. Yeah, Daniel? Um, I think it's interesting that like it's kind of spending me off in realizing like how easily I think that I would sum up my position is that physical attributes are easily exploitable. And I don't think we I think we have to be very aware of how that happens. Like you keep talking about elephant man and we we basically know him because he was still exploited. Like the David Lynch's film that came out in the eighties really didn't touch on how much like it really condoned the doctor. But the doctor was really exploiting him for money. And that was something that we've done a lot with the freak shows that would travel around carnivals and stuff. And so we would really latch onto that. And it's interesting to me, when you start talking about that, with on how easily we have to kind of check our perceptions and what we think when we go into something. Like if we're going to go into a movie, or we're sitting down to read a book, or we're going to hear somebody talk, we already have a preconceived notion of what that person's going to say based on our assessment of something, which is often done through a physical attribute, um, or what our preconceived, or what we know about somebody. Um, and I think that that's dangerous, and an interesting trivia aspect to the film, uh, Elephant Man, Danny DeVito had produced it, but he took his name off of it because he didn't want audiences to know that he had any hand in it, because he has simulated himself as all a comedic actor, because he'd been in um, Taxi and everything like this. And so he didn't want people going into that movie thinking he was actually associated with it because we carry so much of this, what we interpret a person to be. And I think that our world kind of has twisted that level of, well, therefore you're pretty, therefore you are going to be something to look up to if you're ugly or unattractive, or as you would say, hideous of a person. It's where we can simulate that. Where I like what you're saying as far as like we, we need to shift that, but in doing so... Um, Realizing that there is, even in those examples, there are, is that level of exploitation, and I think we just need to be careful. I think we should be careful about how we exploit those attributes in our world. And it's kind of yeah, yeah undoubtedly. I yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, but at the same time, I would also say that, and this is one thing I didn't get into, uh, the person who is on, say, the hideous end of the scale, no one's expecting anything from them. And in fact, what we tend to feel, and you feel this if you're walking down a city street and there's someone who's just smelly, going, please, 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 you don't feel you can give anywhere near enough to help whatever this person's problem is. And it's the same in, in the case of hideousness. On the other end of the scale, when someone walks into a room who's like this model, what they feel is, everyone wants something from me. Now, that's, they're going to feel that. And just as, for instance, if we were to suddenly discover that Reuben here was worth you know, $40 billion. Well, I don't think we're going to discover that, are we? So, but if he, we suddenly were to discover he had all this money, our whole relationship to Reuben would change. And he would feel it. You know? And if I were Reuben, I wouldn't tell anybody. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> but no. It's the same with if you know you're sitting next to you know someone on the level of Albert Einstein or someone who's uh, so talented in something. There are people who have, for one reason or another, gifts at, you know to whom much is given, and their world is often people trying to you know like if Stephen King were to walk in right here right now, I work at writing and stuff, I'd just be like, oh, jeepers, should I tell him about this book I wrote? And you know he gets that all the time. And it's the same with the beautiful person. They get people approaching them in a certain way all the time. 
And yes, there is exploitation, but then this person has to decide how they will live in the world. And again, to whom much is given, much is expected. So they can't walk through the world, you know, if you have a bitchy fashion model, I'm sorry, you're throwing away your cards. You're you're making yourself truly ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Just just a, a final comment, a quick comment maybe. Mm -hmm. We should be considerate about the time. To, sure. I, think, uh, I think we need to be careful on how we use this scale. Yeah, I, I, I it's not this, mathematical. This is, how, this is how the world scales mm -hmm. beauty and ugliness and so on and so forth. But we have to be I think, personally, I'm very critical of it, because I think it's reductionistic. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can reduce beauty. To I, I don't either. Uh, uh, visual <coughs> value. I don't think you can do that. I think, from a Christian perspective, that has to be so many more things from a holistic angle that, that is included before we can talk about anything. Mm -hmm. Beauty. Yeah. And, and at the same time, it's uh, it's just like, I guess my feeling is is that these things are very, it could be something biologically hardwired, or because it seems more than just sociologically constructed. Right. But at the same time, I think we do have to lean against it, which is why in the end, I said maybe the guy who picked me up hitchhiking was more beautiful than the fashion model. Because once you get inside of what you're looking at, it becomes different. However, on the other end, I think we should try to provide beauty in the world. And that does include the way things look. It can't not include the way things look. So, But these are, are tough subjects. And, and like I said, I've been wrestling with this stuff for ages. And sometimes I'm just like, wow, this is so difficult. But thanks for thinking about this stuff with me. So, Okay. Call it quits. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. Love, all alike, no season knows, nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time.